My career started, uh, I left school, uh, there was no work around, Margaret Thatcher, all that lot. I joined the Merchant Navy, I was in the Merchant Navy, and then from the Merchant Navy I came ashore after two years and worked uh, as a landscape gardener, uh, usually in private schools or for private uh, people, you know, private companies. Uh, and then I um, took a job for a man called Paul Ellis, and I was gardening for him, but he worked in a TV studio. He owned a TV studio, and he asked me if I'd work two days a week in a TV studio. I didn't fancy it, so he said, um, uh, can you just come along and clear the leaves off the pond and that kind of thing? So I did, and gradually, got hooked into television. And uh, so when I eventually went to Fountain later, um, I, I had a bit of experience in TV when Bobby took me on at New Malden. And then I uh, worked there as a lighting assistant and uh, loved it and came across different shows, different types of you know, programs there. And w became lighting gaffer, worked as a lighting gaffer and then I kind of worked my way up to camera, which wasn't easy because nobody wanted a lighting assistant or gaffer on camera. So I had quite a bit of hostility there, but there were the occasional cameramen who'd, 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 who'd let you get involved and help you and, and, and encourage you. Uh, and when I did that, we, uh, the studio closed down and I was offered a job here at Wembley, but I took a job at Maidstone for a Polish and Russian channel. Uh, and they sent me all over the place and they put me on a PSC camera course and I was then I went freelance for about a year after that and I got offered a job here at Wembley and then I came to work here. Tony F Edwards phoned me up and he said he wanted an assistant studio manager and then I came along uh, to help him, spoke to Julian and then um, they took me on as a studio manager with him so I've, uh, I've worked with him for 15 years. We do the same role. We just do, uh, you know. We st the, the the role has evolved over the years as, as, as kind of television and technology has changed at a rapid rate. So when I first worked with Tony, we were doing the same what we're doing at New Malden. We would be assisting the uh, lighting director, getting everything ready for him, crewing it up, uh, or gaffering it, uh, or preparing gel lamps, what they need, you know, we'd get a plot, we'd work it out so that when they, when they walk in the building, everything's ready for them. Uh, but over the years, it, it sort of changed, especially with these bigger shows came in. So we started working more for the production manager and the designer and, you know, and the producer. And, and, and the LD was, was kind of last on the list because they, they were pretty, they had their own gaffers and they had their own people, especially when the shows are big. So it, it, the role was completely different at the end. When we found out that the studio was to close down, I started to uh, look into the film days. And not the film days with like Barbara Streisand and, and, and all the, the Elephant Man and the Brazil and those kind of things. Before that, uh, long because I'd heard, I'd heard rumours that there'd been sort of quota quickies or bill fi B films made on this site in the other studios, there were four other studios and two of them were, were, were very old. So I kind of looked around and I could, get, I could get no names of films. I didn't know who was here. I, I vaguely knew about James Mason through Mr. Kempton's website uh, and uh, uh, that's all I kind of knew. So, uh, and I, I was interested because it was closing down and I was horrified to find out how great that history was and um, that I'd not done it earlier. I wish I'd done it earlier because it was, because it was just, it was just golden information coming out. It was just wonderful. So I wrote to the BFI and uh, they sent me a piece of work by a lady called Linda Wood. And she just had a list <laughs> of all the films that had been made here. It's too many for me to say, you know, it's about 50 to sort of 80 films. Uh, and I've kind of picked bits out on my little website thing and, and, and just showed them. Uh, um, but they, they did, they did all kinds of films after I'd found out that uh, when Alfred Hitchcock released Blackmail in England, that was the first talk in England. Uh, Al Jolson had done, you know, the jazz singer in America and Hitchcock did that. And so after that, there was an explosion of sound for the talkies. So this was a, the studio here was a purpose-built sound studio with their, with their own 
sound system in it. And I'd found out that from the 20s, one of the first talkies here, you know, to use this wonderful new medium of sound, was uh, Dark Red Roses. And uh, it was a kind of, it was a kind of story of jealousy and hatred and love triangle and things like that. But it had George Balanchine, I think his name was in it. And he was an American choreographer. He went on to be very famous and he was known as the father of American ballet. Uh, and he moved from Russia and gone to live in America, and that that was the first film. Uh, and then it just they they did more uh, sort of talkies after that, little sort of unknown ones. We, we I can't find the names of most of them anywhere, uh, because in between that time, two of the studios burnt down. There was a big fire, and they burnt down. It, it's a typical film, you know, and it just catches fire if you look at it the wrong way. You know, it's awful stuff. So. Um, and then later, uh, you had Alexander Corder, who made one of his first British films here before he became the great British sort of filmmaker that we, we know, uh, called The Wedding Rehearsal. And I was really shocked because that had Merle Oberon in it, who, uh, so she was walking around here and she went on from here to star as Cathy in Wuthering Heights with Laurence Olivier. Uh, and then it, they, they carried on like that. And then James Mason had an early contract in, in later on in the 30s and 40s. Uh, and they carried on in that vein. So there were, there were dozens of films. I don't know, you know, but one of the most famous ones was City of Song with, I think his name was Jai Kippura in it, uh, an opera singer. Uh, and because it was using the, this new medium of sound, that's what comes across in that film, uh, City of Song. It's a story of an opera singer who, uh, sorry, he's not, he's not known as an opera singer, he's just a, a gondolier man, tour guide in, in Italy. And it's got wonderful footage of Italy in the 1920s, around Vesuvius and all this and all this kind of thing. The English version has um, got Betty Stockwell in it. Uh, it wasn't as good as the German version. Uh, but the the film, the English film, is, is ripped to shreds. It's badly edited. It's all over the place. It's you know. It's, it's, uh, but what stands out on it most is the is him, his opera. It still stands up today. You can still hear that beautiful voice uh, in, in this film. Uh, and they and they carried on uh, making films after the studios had burnt down. They only had one studio, and then they very quickly got a deal. If you in, in the in the uh, on Mr. Kempton's website, he explains that they, they had a deal afterwards where they uh, built more and more studios. So they, they'd probably built about three more studios. I'm not sure how many completely. Nobody quite knows really, but they, and then they carried on making uh, these B movies in, in, the, in those. So after the um, army kinema people during the war made their training films here, they uh, began uh, making films here again, you know, different production companies were different come. And The Ship That Died of Shame was made here, and that was Richard Attenborough in about 54, 1954. Uh, so, because when the owners came in, I think it was Rediffusion later, there were still parts of that set and boats lying around, uh, uh, around the place. Uh, and then later on, the Lee brothers uh, bought the studio, and they, it, when they were here, it was a film studio again uh, they made films here and um, there were two there were two interesting guys and I didn't know anything about them but one of them had come back a few years ago to visit because Tony Edwards uh, met this old grey-haired guy and, and brought him in he just said he wanted to look around and as he went back out somebody said that that was one of the Lee brothers um, so, he, so t Tony actually met one I've never met them but uh, I, I went to a christening where I met uh, Mr. Sharrett, who uh, worked here during the Elephant Man days. And he knew them quite well, and apparently they were, they were real characters. Um, and they were in incredibly successful here. Uh, they, uh, and, and, it, you know, and it was back to making film again. So the, you'd make all these, these wonderful films here, you know, things like Elephant Man and um, Yentl and things like this, you know, the, the, where Barbara Streisand made a directorial debut, which is which is great. You know, it's just wonderful. Uh, during the Lee days, for for me, I, that's when I wish I'd been here because that that would have been a magical period for me, because you'd have films like Elephant Man here, you know, that amazing story of that Victorian doctor uh, Frederick Treves uh, finding this man on a fairground, 
uh, been treated really cruelly and is horribly disfigured. And then only to find out that there's a beautiful soul inside who, who, is, uh, who is intelligent, sensitive. Uh, and Anthony Hopkins played Frederick Treves and John Hurt uh, played the Elephant Man. And um, our boiler man who's passed away now, bless him, uh, he, he was here during that period because he said he got drunk with John Hurt in the body room. And um, f f that, that would have been a magical film to see and work on. And, you know, they did, they did all the exteriors in here, like the friend stuff. They set up all the sets and it would, it, that would have been fascinating to see. I'd love to have seen that. Uh, same, I'd like to have seen bits of Empire Strikes Back as well. You know, that, that was another uh, part. So that was shot here during the Lee days. Uh, Brazil, you know, that kind of uh, thing. To think that Robert De Niro would have been here on the exteriors doing that, uh, as well as Jonathan Price. We've had Jonathan Price in since, and, um, but I'd like to have seen Robert De Niro. And there are lots, lots of other films like Quadrophenia, so you would have had, you would have had The Who walking around and Sting uh, and uh, all the wonderful cast on, on that film. Um, and for me, I'd like to have seen Barbara Streisand uh, here because uh, it, it was great for her because it was one of the first big female directors. She'd fought for about 10 years to get that story uh, made. And then she finally got it and they shot in all those lovely locations in Eastern Europe and then shot here uh, and replicated some of the Eastern European scenes out the back. And I know they did because Jimmy, uh, the same boiler man, told me that they cobbled the street just like the cobbles on the exterior shot in, I think it was Czech Republic. And uh, it was great for her because it was a directorial debut, which was just wonderful. And then she, you know, she just went on to be like the biggest selling female singer in the world. She was only taken over by uh, Beyonce or Mariah Carey uh, in the 90s. So uh, it, that, that was fascinating. I'd love to have seen her uh, because I, I know that um, this Mr. Sharrett I met at a, a christening, he said that he saw Barbara Streisand in the canteen, it was called the bar then, at, at, at one end talking with her Hollywood friends and the Lee brothers having a kind of drunken debor debaucherous party at the other end. And that, that must have been a bit like X Factor really, you know, so, <laughs> a pop idol. Um, so they, they, they must have been uh, days that were as magical as those talkies, you know, that some of the people in the talkies who went on to be massive Hollywood stars, uh, just great. During the television, one of the television periods when LWT were here, what would have interested me and I'd love to have seen would have been when they shot uh, Upstairs, Downstairs here, because that was, that was the Downton Abbey of its day. It inspired Downton Abbey. You know, you can, you can tell, it, it just reeks of it. Uh, and I'd love to have seen Gordon Jackson uh, in, in those lovely performances before he got into the professionals and did a kind of half-assed Jack Regan, you know, impersonation. But, um, he, he, he was great in that, as was everybody else. And I think it was on Bremner, Bird and Fortune, I met one of the writers from Upstairs, Downstairs. She's the lady who plays Rose. She came in to do a comedy sketch with them. And I, I just asked her about those days and she just said she remembered it being chaotic here because of the colour strike and that, although that didn't affect them, they've just been shot. She just said it was, it was you know, because I think some of them were lo looked almost live. Uh, there were lots of crossroads sets moving and people looking at each other for too long and long, long delays and things like that, which is wonderful telly for me. I love it. <laughs> this studio today is quite well known and, and, and quite famous because of its unusual selling point, the, the great big wall that comes down on the battleship motors. That's always everybody's, when everybody comes to see it, uh, even the Quintain people who came to see it just went, ooh, you know, what, what, what's that? You know, because it's like some kind of medieval drawbridge silent drawbridge um, which uh, and, and the studio beca became very well known after Friends came here. Friends put it back on the map again in terms of telly but it really hit the map when Pop Idol came here. Uh, everybody knew about us then because uh, it wasn't very financially successful for us Friends because they didn't really make any money out of it they were just doing it for the kudos because really you know not quite sure how it how it how it came here because they, they could have gone to a, a big stage at Pinewood or a bit, but they came here, uh, and f 
speaking to Tony about meeting and working with the Americans, it was, that was highly entertaining. Uh, but when Pop Idol came, that, that changed everything. Because for one thing, uh, Cowell walked into the building and he was just a guest on that show. And he, and he, he kind of looked, he obviously looked around and thought, mm, quite like this. And um, came back with the show X Factor later. But we got Pop Idol because of Andy Wormsley, really. He, um, he'd done Millionaire and he, he'd done lots of shows here. Uh, Tony'd worked with him on loads of shows. He was the set designer. And he went off, he wrote some article in uh, Broadcast Magazine and he went off to live in Hollywood. And he, was, he, he ended up doing American Idol and things like that. And he was doing TV shows over there. And he used to write to me every other sort of month and send pictures of him at an Elvis convention with his collar up and or, or things like this. And, he, and then he wrote to me and told me that he'd been to the Oscars. He'd got invited to the Oscars. And he wrote down everything that happened at the Oscars. That was fascinating that he'd been, that he'd been to the Oscars. That, that was absolutely incredible. And uh, we were here and I had a message from him and he said, I can't get in touch with anybody. I've tried to get in touch with the MD and uh, whatever. There's a show here and, and you need to, you know, you need to send me some plans to America now of the studio. So I, I what, what? And he said, it's an it's a entertainment show. It's a kind of music-y thing. It's LE. And he said, um, you know, it'd be, it'd be great. So I, I need to get the plans here. Then we can get in contact with bookings and the, and the MD. So I went upstairs and I said, I need to send these plans to America. And I'll never forget, with FedEx, it was 45 quid. And one of the accounts, the accounts lady said, uh, well, who's going to pay for that? We don't know what this show is. It might never come about. And I said, well, it's kind of Andy Wormsley. And I, you know, I kind of trust his word. He's, he's, he's got a good eye and a good ear. Uh, and she said, well, who's going to pay for it? So uh, I, I d wouldn't pay for it. So I went to Mariana and she just said, just send it FedEx, just send it. And so I sent these plans off to uh, Hollywood, C uh, CBS. And uh, Andy told me that uh, the studio there at CBS had always said that they were bigger than Fountain. They were much they were, were bigger than that Fountain place in England. Uh, and he said he laughed his head off when he got these plans through that day. He put them out in front of the CBS plans and the CBS guy was there. And he said, oh, I'm really sorry, Fountain's a foot bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, we were one foot bigger than this, some studio in America, which I thought was great. And then um, Pop Idol, you know, Pop Idol appeared. It, it, it came. But when I first came up to Wembley, we were doing kind of run-of-the-mill quiz shows, the occasional sitcom, we'd, we'd do Fast Show and Kumas, things like that. But today, we're really well known for these big LE music shows uh, we, we we actually did a little strictly one of the strictly when it was it wasn't celebrities it was kind of normal people uh, so we were known in the industry for these big le shows especially after pop idol um, and, and x factor and that that's what we're we're known for now which is in which is great and you meet wonderful people on those shows i've never seen guests you know so many guests like that but I, I, I did love the sitcoms. You know, the Fast Show was fantastic, and Celeb uh, was was really good. And the the, uh, the clone we did with uh, Jonathan Price, uh, a different it's a different type of atmosphere. It's, it's how I imagine now that Mother Brown's Boys would be. That looks like your typical sitcom uh, from the seventies. And I love that show, but looking at it, because they shoot backstage and they pull the cameras back, that, that is exactly what it was like on things like The Fast Show and, and all these sketch shows that we did and uh, Al Murray's personality disorder, it did all that. Um, but today, it's, it, it, towards the end of its, its days, it's known for these big LE shows. Yeah, the closure of this studio, it, it, it'll, it'll impact the local area. Uh, because I think you know they were they were they were quite pleased that they had this this studio here that had been here since the days of talkies, uh, right up to the days of X Factor. Uh, even though they they did come round and always moan about our fire lanes and tell us that we needed to do this and constantly sort of monitor us. Uh, but the the impact um, in the industry, I, I I don't know. You can never you can you can never tell. I mean, television I, I think is is going to 
Television, I think, is going to be even more powerful. Everybody says it's dying because of the internet and blah, blah. I don't think it is. I think that the McTaggart lecture by uh, Kevin Spacey is right because as television has gone into House of Cards and, you know, the, the, these kind of things, uh, I think it will get more powerful and you'll need, you'll need places like this. Um, so it, it's, it's quite sad in that respect. And, that, and the, it'll have an impact on the, lo on the local area. We, we, we provided quite a lot of work for freelancers and lots of people learnt, learnt their, their trade here and things like that. So uh, it's just weird to think that uh, it'll be a block of flats.